But you hit on something really crucial right there. You said that the soils are so contaminated, and that was with, with cesium-137, correct? Cesium-137 and 134. That's how you know it came from Fukushima. If it was just cesium-137, it could be bomb, it could be Chernobyl. But when you see 134 and 137 together, that's the signature from Fukushima. Right, that's because every, every uh, fuel source in the nuclear industry has a particular... Uh, elemental signature or fingerprint, you might say, that can identify its source. Uh, and what's, what's crucial about what you just said also is that the, if the soils are contaminated, cesium is very close to the, the mineral action of potassium in plants. So I believe that when plants are grown, when food crops are grown in soil contaminated by cesium, to the extent that those plants would normally uptake potassium, which is a common mineral in many many crops, including potatoes, for example, they would uptake that cesium, which would go into the food, so that the people who grew their food on that land would then be eating radioactive food. Yeah, cesium is exactly chemically like potassium. If you remember your high school chemistry, they're right above each other in the periodic chart. But the, um, so they're both muscle seekers. And what we find with, um, with, with cesium poisoning is that, especially in kids that are growing, um, Illnesses like something called Chernobyl heart, uh, where the cesium builds uh, up in a muscle that's rapidly growing, like an infant or a fetus's heart, and causes heart damage or heart holes. Um, that um, while the the infant may live for the rest of their life um, after surgery, you know their their life is um, expectancy is shortened and the quality of life is is minimal. So cesium is a muscle seeker. It, it also produces cancers, obviously, but because it's radioactive. But in addition, it can do damage to muscles, especially in kids that are uh, rapidly growing. So this, this, yeah, this is an indiscriminate, uh, um, obviously it can be used as a weapon by terrorists or, or even false flag attacks, that, which is another concern of many of the listeners here on the Alex Jones Show. We had a, a report from Mike Bundrant, who's one of our, our contributing writers over at Natural News. He was in Tokyo recently. And he discovered that many families are eating this contaminated food because their parents or their other family members are living in a state of denial. They've been told by the Japanese government that this is safe, so they're planting food on this contaminated soil. They're eating this radioactive food, and they, they are doing so knowing it's radioactive, but they're, they're, they can't go against their other family members because of the very powerful you know, uh, parental family structure often in, that you find in Japanese families. And the, these middle-aged uh, Japanese citizens, uh, they're going to die of cancer from it. You know, you're absolutely right. It's a cultural problem there, and the government is playing on the cultural problem. Um, there's, a, there's a ray of hope here because the women of Japan aren't buying it. Um, the men seem to be saying, well, my government told me it's safe, therefore it's safe. Whereas the women, especially the young child-bearing age women, are, are just saying, uh, you know, hell no, we won't glow, I guess is the old term. <laughs> That's a good one. But they, the, um, the, the women in Japan are um, a significant majority in all of these marches that you see, which is unheard of for Japan. I mean, the, the women... Right. Arnie, out Arnie, sorry to interrupt you. We've got to go to a break, but stay with us. I want to ask you on the other side of this break about the 85 times Chernobyl radiation figure that's been floating around. That and much more straight ahead here on the Alex Jones. The continuation of life as we know it in the Northern Hemisphere doesn't mean it's going to kill us all, but it does mean it could threaten the, 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 the healthy continuation of life as we know it. It could threaten crops. It could threaten literally millions of acres of farming land across North America if a worst-case scenario happens. And, and sadly, the worst-case scenario uh, could be unleashed in many ways from another earthquake, another tsunami that hits the Fukushima facility. This is an issue that affects North America. It affects Europe. It, it, it affects Russia. It affects China. It's not just Japan that's affected by this, and that's why we're featuring this information here. Arnie, before the break, I asked you about this figure that's been floating around this 85 times. I guess there's been a calculation of the total amount of, of unspent fuel or partially spent fuel in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility, and that was calculated to be 85 times, roughly 85 times the amount of, of uh, energy released in the Chernobyl accident in, I believe, 1986. Is, is that figure accurate, or does it need to be fact-checked? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure where they got that. Uh, it, 
I believe Fukushima is worse than Chernobyl, and, and I'm, I think I can prove that. I think that that number may also include um, the, the possibility of the meltdown of the fuel in the fuel pools, which hasn't occurred yet. So um, if you look at the three reactors that melted down, um, clearly they released more noble gases, things like xenon and krypton, at least triple what, uh, what Chernobyl released. And they actually picked that up in, um, in Seattle. Um, this is separate from the hot particles in Seattle, but uh, there was uh, xenon and krypton picked up to the tune of 100,000 times normal uh, in Seattle in March and April after the accident, published peer-reviewed stuff. But th so that's one kind of isotope, and that doesn't react with anything. It pops right out of the fuel. But the, um, um, this, the um, uh, cesium and the um, iodine and, and things like that are probably roughly on the order maybe twice as much as Fukushima. You, you know, it's, this is such a horrific accident, but it's hard to believe the Japanese were lucky. But there's, there's two things they were lucky about. One is that 80% of the time the wind blew out to sea. You know, and so most of this, 78% of this radiation wound up in the ocean. That's not good for the fish and ultimately not good for us, but it's good for the people in Japan. The, the other piece of it was it happened on a Friday. And they had a, a thousand people at Daiichi and a, another thousand at uh, uh, Daini. Uh, had that not happened, if it happened on a weekend, um, Daini would have melted down as well. There's four reactors there that would have melted down as well. So uh, we could have had ten nuclear reactors melting down uh, if this thing had happened on a Saturday. Well, this gets back to the the, the whole thing called Murphy's Law and. I, I'm really starting to question the uh, the ability of science to anticipate the long-term implications of its present-day actions. What about the amount of energy contained in these 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 partially spent fuel rods that that could conceivably burn? Is there any estimation of how much energy is in that fuel compared to Chernobyl? Oh, that would be twenty times Chernobyl. I'm sure. You know, so here suddenly that eighty-five doesn't look too unrealistic when you start looking at any single fuel pool. You know, I said earlier, you know, everybody's focused on Unit 4, and, and rightfully so, but Unit 3 had a more severe explosion and is likely structurally weakened even more than Unit 4. And the Unit 3 pool has about half as much nuclear fuel as the Unit 4 pool. So it's not, it's not clear to me... Um, um, that, that unit three is a whole heck of a lot better. What is the thinking behind this idea of whoever engineered these these nuclear power plants? And I know uh, U.S. corporations. I think General Electric was one was part of the key designer. You can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But what is this idea of let's store nuclear fuel 30 meters above the ground in a pool? Why not always store it at ground level or underground, even on site? That, that's a great question. I asked that question 40 years ago when I started my career. And at the time, uh, they, they don't do that anymore. Uh, the, it's just this Mark I reactor and, and a few Mark IIs that, that do that. All the other boiling water reactors, the Mark Threes, and all the other pressurized water reactors do store it down low. The, the, at the time this thing was designed, you've got to remember, this was designed in the mid-60s, um, they were afraid that if they opened gates and, and, and the fuel pool was lower than a nuclear reactor, they could drain the nuclear reactor. So if they put the pool on the same elevation as the reactor, that wouldn't happen. So th there was a logic behind it, but then they, uh, they basically developed a better fuel transfer mechanism that that doesn't happen. I see. Uh, you know, the, the, you can get this fuel out of these pools. The, the, the technology is there. Um, this uh, dry cask storage is available, and there were dry casks at Fukushima. They all survived the tsunami just fine. In the U.S., we could take all of our fuel pools that are totally overcrowded and put them on the ground. Um, but the problem is the, the NRC is letting the utilities that own them get away with it because they don't want to spend the money. Well, of course. Isn't it always about saving money, even if they put the population at risk, and that's the sad part about this. But if you get back to the 1960s, when this was being designed, this this is this a, is this a Mark One facility or a Mark Two? This is a Mark One. Mark One. 
certainly in the 1960s the scientists at that time must have known that Japan that whole region was geologically extremely active that was that's not a big secret even in the 1960s how could they I'm, I'm not asking I'm not accusing you obviously you didn't put it there but I'm asking you to try to help us understand what kind of weird thinking went on how could they even place a nuclear facility right on the coast where it would be hit by a tsunami why isn't the international community and the US in particular on all hands on deck red alert let's go over there and solve this problem Im immediately and eliminate this danger now uh, my one word answer is is money the um, you know and it's not we didn't have to wait for Fukushima to know that uh, that that a problem of this nature was was looking over our shoulder. Um, there there have been experts out there saying it for years, my, myself included. Um, there there's this stuff called dry cast storage, where after the fuel's about three or four years old, it will can, can be cooled in air, and so it gets put in these casts. It's still hotter than a pistol from a radiation standpoint, but the physical heat is down. They put them in these huge casts that weigh 100 or more tons, and they set them on the ground. And uh, uh, until we get a, a long-term storage solution, the best place is out of those pools and on the ground. The, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is playing games with this, and they're saying, well, we need to consider all of the costs um, as well as the benefit of getting it out of the pool. But wait, but wait a minute, let me interrupt you there, I, and I apologize, Arnie, but... When they needed to bail out Goldman Sachs, they came up with the money. They just created a trillion dollars out of nothing, and they bailed out the banks. So <clears throat> how is it that, that banks, that saving the banks is more important than saving humanity, potentially? <laughs> I mean, I, does, does the NRC, does the U.S. government not understand a scale of dangers? I, I don't get this. Why are, the, why are the banks more important than saving humanity? No, I think you're absolutely right. You know, and the money's there. It, it's not like, you know, well, for the banks, we had to create the money, sort of. But there's a 30, uh, $27 billion fund for long-term storage. Now, that's set aside for looking for geological storage and things like that. But uh, we could use that fund. So we have been put, putting in a tenth of a penny per kilowatt of nuclear power we use for years and years and years. And so this fund has developed over $20 billion. We could use that fund to put it all into, put all these uh, fuel pools into dry cast storage, and this problem would be solved, both from a terrorism standpoint as well as from, you know, an act of God like at Fukushima. This is solvable. What kind of time frame, if the money were made available today, let's say if the Federal Reserve actually wanted to solve this problem, and they went into their little computer, and they typed in some digits and created another trillion dollars, like they did every time they wanted to bail out Wall Street, uh, if that money were available, what are we talking in terms of total cleanup? Like 10 weeks? Longer? Six months? What, what's the, what do you think it is? You just have to fabricate the containers, and it would probably take a year or two to, to fabricate enough containers. So, you know, certainly within three years it's solvable. And, and it doesn't even take an act of Congress or the Federal Reserve. It just takes the Nuclear Regulatory Commission saying do it.